more than the warming projection changes of the IPCC. Consider the fact that I live in Texas. In August, the temperature can easily go above 100 degrees. But in the morning, Texas is a very nice place. So you work in the morning, you rest in the middle of the day, and you go water skiing after the wind dies down. That's not what I would call a bad health situation for most people. And so when you think about it, consider the practical aspects of what the IPCC says is going to be the effect of a one, two, or three degree change in the climate of the globe. And the climatologists will tell you that any global warming is going to produce a mitigation of wintertime and nighttime temperatures. It won't have any significant effect on daytime high temperatures. That's all important stuff to know. Climate is one thing, weather is another. And the temperature of your particular location is dependent upon all kinds of circulatory and other, and other factors. I assert that warm is good for human health and that global warming, even in the most extreme estimates, will not create heat illness or death increases and certainly no changes that are more important than the basic public health measures of vector control, water, nutrition, sewage and water quality, and housing quality. If people can live in better housing, live at a higher level of quality of life, then diseases are going to go away. That's what happens. If Petersburg was the source of big trouble with regards to malaria, consider that anybody making, a, you know, making an assertion that global warming is a big factor in malaria. As Dr. Ryder points out, it's almost getting to the point where it's a joke. The impact of modern medical measures and technology as well as the quality of life is more important to the health of the people of the planet. So is warm good for your health? Well, yeah, it is. Uh, the answer, uh, most people go to warm places to mitigate the effects of stressful cold weather. And in fact, people go to the hot springs, they get their vacations in the warm places, and they move down south when they get old. So it's not so hard on them. Why is it, why is it that cold is hard on people? Well, because cold temperatures produce vascular effects and have a generally debilitating effect on the human body which likes to operate at about 98.6. So, if you happen to live in a cold climate, there are going to be times in the year when stress is a big factor in your life. But in addition to that, you have to remember that there is a cycle that produces an increase in disease during the cold, cold times of the year. January in the Northern Hemisphere is the most deadly month. Why would that be? Well, because the viruses tend to go around at that time. And old folks get viruses, and then they get pneumonia, and then they die. Pretty simple. Emergency physician. Trust me, that's what happens. And that's the reason why wintertime and cold weather are tough on people. They're tough on people with vascular disease, which is the leading cause of the deterioration of the human body as you progress to older age. Your vascular condition is the critical factor in how your brain works, how the rest of your body works. And if cold has a negative effect on your vascular status, then it's going to have an effect on your health. People die more during the cold months. People of all ages get more sick in the winter and the summer. It's better for a child to be born in the spring or the summer than to be born in the winter. We can all think of our children who were born during the summer had an easy time of it. Our kids who were born during the winter picked up viruses, picked up the kinds of things that happen when people have to live inside. The World Health Organization also makes the heat wave death effects into an argument that global warming is going to be really hard on the population of the planet. I happen to work for the Army. We see a little heat illness. Imagine this, you send even a well-conditioned soldier 
to a place like Iraq. Midday temperatures, 130 degrees. Full body armor, helmet, and not exactly strolling around, <laughs> right? We don't see the kind of heat illness that would even make us worry to, about this population of soldiers that are in an extreme level of stress in a very hot climate. Why is it that the World Health Organization can make such an assertion? Well, because we had uh, a, a heat wave in Chicago that killed a bunch of people that lived in what I would consider to be less than ideal housing, and because there was a heat wave death epidemic in France during August a few years ago. And that's why it sort of developed a life of its own. Hot days are going to kill a lot of people. It's the end of the world. Global warming is going to produce a tremendous increase in the number of deaths. Heat illness is essentially a failure of our thermal regulatory mechanism. As I said, we operated 98.6. 99.6 rectally, dogs operated 102, horses operated 100.5, God knows what elephants operate at, but we are mammals and we do regulate our own internal temperatures. So if the heat index is in excess of 100, then we are at risk for heat illness. And all the things that produce heat illness have to do with our water intake, our general condition, and our current medications. Our general condition, including all of those factors that might produce susceptibility to heat. So from my point of view, the crisis that supposedly we're dealing with with regards to a one, two, or three degree increase in the average temperature of the planet is pretty ridiculous when you consider that warm is better for your health, cold is not as good for your health, and it is only special circumstances that produce heat illness. So, from my point of view, um, you say, well, how is it that we got to this point? We got to this point because global warming is in the form of a religion at this point. And there are a number of scientists who have thrown away their ability to analyze things in a rational fashion and deal with public health health epidemiology and look at the data and try to separate themselves from the issue so that what you're looking at many times in the popular, popular literature and even in the scientific literature is very bad public health epidemiology with relative risks that are clearly not proof of anything. They're associations. So when you look at the numbers and somebody says, well, there's a 20% increase in the death rate if you're exposed to X, Y, or Z. Remember, translated for an epidemiologist, that means that the relative risk is 1.2, which according to the rules is not enough to prove causation. Epidemiology is a very sophisticated thing when it's done right, and it's very junky when it's done wrong. And there is entirely too much bad epidemiology that's going on in the public health community. Thank you very much.